I think that success in, in songwriting comes down to, to three things. So one of them is the quality of your writing. Tonight we have a very special guest, Victoria Banks. I'm first gonna read you a little bit about her because it's too much to remember. She's been nominated for 11 Canadian Country Music Association Awards, um, named CCMA Female Artist of the Year, Songwriter of the Year. Um, she's had cuts by, oh gosh, a long list, hits by Sarah Evans, Jessica Simpson, um, Johnny Reed, Canadian artist, which we'll talk about Canada, I'm sure. Yeah. And she's had over 100 cuts, Carly Pierce, Lauren Elena, Terry Clark, Cassidy Pope, Mickey Guyton, The Shires, Isaac Slade of The Frayed, I mean, on and on and on. Let's talk about where it all started. How did you get started in music? And Well, my family are all musicians, but they're all classical musicians. Mm -hmm. So um, I grew up up in Canada in an area called Muskoka, Ontario. It was very remote. Um, grew up in a, in a house that was heated with just wood. Uh, in the wow. middle of the woods and my dad still lives there. He's 80 years old He's still he's still chopping the wood and living there by himself But it was in the snow belt We had tons of snow in the winter like a good 8 to 12 feet of snow each winter enough that you had to shovel the roof off, you know, and uh, And so you find ways of entertaining yourself and I have a little sister So it was my mom dad <laughs> sister and I and we were kind of a, a kooky wacky family so we did a lot of um uh, well we did a lot of classical music we did a lot of choral music bach music um we, and you would sing together? yeah we'd sing like yeah. four-part harmony bach wow. motets around the around the dinner table kind of thing i did piano lessons vocal lessons um but i didn't really realize there was any kind of music post 1940 until i went to school and then started going what is this you know and i started playing in in bands, I picked up a, a guitar because my, unfortunately my piano training was really limited to learning how to read what was on the page. And right. I never learned how to make anything up and I'm still frustrated by that. Um, but with guitar, I was able to kind of teach myself. And, and from there I was off into, you know, playing in bands that covered Creedence Clearwater Revival, John Mellencamp, Rolling Stones, yeah. you know, stuff like that. And, um, and then I fell in love with songwriting through those things. And that took me down the road of listening to people like Steve Earle, Lucinda Williams, sort of the, the Texas influence country. And that took me to listening to Nashville. And then I found myself, you know, buying country records and looking at the liner notes back when you could. And, and I started to really pay attention to who the tiny print names were under the songs and who are these people because they're not always the same person yeah. that's on the album cover. And uh, that was fascinating to me. So I, being a little bit of a, you know, music nerd, I started this little binder. I still have it. It's like a little binder. And it was a list of songwriter names that I I would see these names come up over and over again. So I'd if there was a song that really moved me, I'd write down hmm, Tony Arada, you know, and then and then I'd write the song name, and then there he'd show up again somewhere else. I'd write that song name down. So I did this, made this little collection, and there were certain ones in there that I was like, whoa, this person wrote like Matresa Berg. She was a huge one for me. Matresa Berg wrote this, 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 like all these songs that I love, and who is this woman? Right. And, so um, it's really cool because now that now that I'm here, I've been able to work with some of those people, I know. and awesome. I can take the binder and go look. You're you're in my binder, <laughs> my little binder, <laughs> my nerd binder. <laughs> That's awesome. So you moved here in '97, and you instantly had a big hit overnight. <laughs> <laughs> well, it it almost happened that way. Strangely okay. enough, <laughs> I was being funny. But strangely <laughs> enough, well. It, you know, I think sometimes I look back on it and I'm like, I had no business getting a publishing deal with the songs that I was writing at the time, but I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, everybody, uh, women were doing great on country radio in yeah. the late 90s, and a lot of publishers did not have women on staff as, as songwriters, and they wanted that perspective. They wanted women who were writing with a pop leaning. And that was exactly what I was doing. And so within six months of being here, I was offered my first deal, which was with um, Rick Hall's company, oh, Fame yeah. Music, that was, um, was you know, affiliated with Muscle Shoals Studios. That was my first six years of writing was, was there. Wow. And I was 
terrible at collaborating, which of course is the thing you're expected to do right away. And so I tried to do that and sucked at it immensely. And they saw, they were kind of like, you know, they'd go through the song list of everything I submitted and they'd say, well, we like, you know, these are great and these ones are not so much. And I'd be like, well, the ones you like are the ones I wrote by myself. And, oh, wow. and so they said, well, just write by yourself then. And they encouraged me to do that. And the, so the whole first six years of my career, I wrote alone and wow. had my first success that way. So my first cut was um, a, a solo written song that Sarah Evans recorded and it was on her Born to Fly record, a song called Saints and Angels. Yes. And so that kind of, you know, started my career in a weird way. Um, and there's something to be said for getting a cut when you've written it by yourself. There's no question as to how much you contributed yeah. to it. So it, it, you know, it, it was good, but then I couldn't really, because I wasn't collaborating, because I was afraid to collaborate, I wasn't really able to take advantage of the momentum that that could have given right. me, you know, in the industry, because I, it took me way longer than it should have to realize the importance of connection network in and how that's pretty much equally right. as important as the quality of your songwriting. So maybe let's just take a few of these questions here. Sure. Do you have a specific way of writing like writing the chorus first? So that's a great question because it really is different all the time for me. Um, if when I'm coming up with ideas, I find that I do it best when my mind is occupied with some other thing. So usually if I'm driving, that's usually the best time for me where I'm on a big road trip, don't even turn on the radio, just turn on my mind. And I'll just think of things and sing things into my phone and collect them. Um, I did a trip to Atlanta a few months ago and between here and Atlanta, I came up with 27 song ideas <laughs> and it was like, not just the title, but big chunks of oh, nice. a lot of the time it'll be melody and lyric chunks of it, or it'll be, um, rhythm, like spoken in rhythm, but I don't have the melody yet. Um, but what I, what I do like to do is if I find something that sounds like a cool hook, then I kind of go from there to what would the setup line be for it so kind of what's the line before that what's the rhyme and then find a really cool rhyme that gets to that and then that so it's kind of like uncovering the sand you know taking the sand sweeping the sand off it to see what's there next to it and right you know and then you kind of figure out from that you get clues to what else leads to that so um there's a lot of working backwards that i do yeah. that way um but you know i'm collaborating all the time with so many different people that have so many different styles of writing and I feel like a chameleon a lot of the time, depending on what the need is in the room. Yeah. I'll be the I'll be the lyric person, or I'll be the melody person, or I'll be the guitar group person, whatever needs to happen. Um, but for the most part, I end up being the, they call me the lyric Nazi <laughs> because <laughs> I'll be the one that's like, ah, let's slow down here. Is this right yet? You know, like, yeah. are these the? Can we make these words fight harder in this line? So that's kind of my thing. <laughs> When you write with an artist and a track guy, do you bring in the idea to the artist or the track guy first? Or So um, we're, we pretty much all get there at the same time. We start talking a little bit about what's going on in everybody's life. Um, I usually ask the question first of the artist, is there anything you have a burning desire to write today? Because yeah. sometimes they've got something that's on their mind and if there's something like that, then you tap into that. Um, but if the answer is no, then usually based on the conversation we've had, I'll find something, you know, that, that will work um, for them that they can relate to based on what I know is going on in their life. But I also beforehand will totally stalk the artist on all of their social media. I'll listen to everything they've released to try and figure out what their style is. You know, you want to know what kind of vocal range you're working in. And um, being, you know, really a, a chameleon writer, it's like, okay, is this like a bluesy song we're writing today? Is it a pop song we're writing today? Like, what is it going to be? So um, that's kind of that's kind of my approach in those situations. Do you ever bring in ideas ahead of time or do you really try to pull it out of the room? I usually try to pull it out of the room to an extent. I like to at least make it feel like it's being pulled out of the room even right. if it's not, you know, just because I've learned from many, you know, I've had many experiences writing a great song with an artist 
that they don't feel like they had a part of enough of a part of and they just don't it just doesn't feel like something they want to put on the record usually yeah. so you have to include them in the process of it and um make sure that they're contributing if not you know chunks of song then contributing I ideas and, and asking okay what would you say here what how did you feel when this happened you know kind of right. getting them talking so that you can use that material in what you're writing have you been in a situation where the artist does not want to change a specific lyric or melody even though you feel it's great how do you deal with that yes that's a really good question so the thing is, when you're writing with an artist, your best shot at getting that song cut is by that artist. Having to pitch it to someone else is, you don't want to have to do that because it's really hard. Outside pitches are really hard. And especially when there's an artist on the song, people will be like, well, why isn't that an artist cutting it? You know, so it, you want it to be something that the artist is invested in. That means that the best lyric or the best melody is not necessarily the end game here. It's the best lyric or melody that the artist wants that's going to be the end game. Um, so a lot of the times you end up compromising and you end up compromising on the song's overall direction sometimes. It's like, okay, this could go this way or that way, but the artist wants to go this way, so that's the way we're going, you know? Um, and that's the best you can do because the most important thing is that they feel ownership in it and then you make it the best it can possibly be in that context. Right. You, yeah. You're shooting for the best song within that framework. Mm -hmm. And also it helps for writers like us that write a lot of songs that, okay, if if you're not 100% crazy about what you wrote today, well, you're going to write 200 more songs yeah. in the near future. Yeah. So it's a little easier to let go because yeah. it's not like every song has to be. But, I mean, having said that, I, you're, I know you're like this, and I am, and most pro writers, every day we're trying to get the best song out of that room that day. Yes, yeah. Um, and... One time I was in a situation writing with a, a band that had an, a record deal, and it was me, a co-writer, and four people in the group. Mm. And there was a line that they just loved, and my co-writer kept fighting, going, mm -hmm. oh, this isn't good. Mm -hmm. And I finally had to pull her outside the room, and I said, okay, they are pumped about the song. Mm -hmm. If we keep fighting them, they're, they're going to lose all their enthusiasm for the song. Yeah. And so she agreed to kind of go with it and it was became their first single. Mm. And so we could have fought all day for that line and to the point where they just didn't care for the song anymore. You yeah. know? So at some point you have to say, OK, this is the best song that's going to come out of the room today. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't mean maybe later on if there's an opportunity, you can, you know, hey, mm. send them a text, say, hey, I, what about this line but I don't know it's just yeah you, well, you want to get the best song that day you do and and I've had some it's been really interesting in this you know phase that we're in now of doing so many artist rights with track people where I've had a lot of artists tell me several artists tell me boy I love working with you because you listen to me and because you're willing to change something. And I think a lot of the time they'll run into people who are resistant about that because we're purists and we're right. songwriters and we want it to be the best it can be. But it, it's important. That flexibility is really important. And you can always, there, there's, a, there's a lot of that having to let go of what you, you know, think it needs to be and then there's a new challenge okay how do we work in this context and make this really good you know so or if you've got three people in the room why not come up with a line that everybody that everybody likes? likes yeah and and often that line that you're attached to is there could be five other lines that could beat it you know yeah. so it's you know it's just having faith that it's out yeah, there just explore it right. and yeah 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 cool yeah that's a great question well I think we're going to wrap it up. All right. Any words of advice for our songwriters that um, want to be writing hits? Okay. So, <laughs> Dare to Suck is a really big one. Just dare to suck. Get in that chair. Write as much as you can. Don't be too married to the songs that you've written so far. 
keep going, keep going, because the more you do it, the more you're going to evolve and you're going to blow yourself away for how much better you get when you're looking back at what you were writing a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, the more you do it. So that's a huge one. And the other thing is, um, I, I know I mentioned this earlier, but I think that success in, in songwriting comes down to, to three things. So one of them is the quality of your writing, which of course you can work on. And it comes down to probably 33%, you know, 33% that, 33% your network, who you know. And the other 33% is luck. You don't have any control over the luck, but you can raise your odds of it by working on the other two. So um, just keep in mind that your network is incredibly important and to just try and connect with people on a real human level and you're not you talking about you have to be born knowing people. No, not at all. That network is something you can build. Yes. Like, I came to town. I didn't know anyone the first time I came to town. You yeah. can build that. Yeah, you yeah. can. The people that you're writing with, the people that you're crossing paths with, um, you know, putting yourself in situations like with Songtown where you have the opportunity to to connect with other people that are doing what you're doing. Um, and, and, you know, networking is just... It's such a funny thing to call it networking. It's not, you know, this Machiavellian plan that you have. It's just being real with people and giving people love, whatever opportunity you have to do it. Trying to see what they need from you and giving them a little piece of that. You know, like, uh, it's, so you're in a great position being part of this organization and just soaking up everything that you can from all of these great, you know, songwriters like Clay. I want to talk about our friends at Sweetwater who sponsor this podcast. Probably <laughs> probably close to two decades, I have been getting my audio and video equipment from Sweetwater. And, you know, I just can't say enough about them. They're great guys. Yeah, there's a link in the show notes to some books Clay and I've written. Clay's got a great book on melody writing that's now out on Audible. See you next time. <laughs>